Hey everybody, thanks for stopping by. I'm Eric Johnson and this is the Burley Flow Podcast. Every week I post a story from up here in Burley Flow, Wisconsin, a little town on the banks of the Mississippi River in the southwest corner of the state. If you like small towns or cheese curds or fishing, or maybe you're just curious about life in the upper Midwest, well, this might be the podcast for you. So go ahead and subscribe now while you're thinking of it. And after it's over, feel free to poke around the website at burlyflow.com. You'll find a bunch more content, excerpts from my book, and information about even more content over on my Patreon page. Oh, and before I forget, thanks for being here. To the best of my knowledge, no one knows the real story behind Ichabod the Heron, but you know there's got to be one. A town doesn't just get a mascot, or a patron saint, depending on who you talk to, without a story. I'm one of those people who's usually content to discover things like this over time. Unlike most, I actually miss the pre-Google days. It seems to me part of life is wondering about stuff, and when you lose the opportunity to ponder the little things... That only leaves the big things. Am I happy? What does it all mean? We shouldn't be encouraged to go places like that, but when the road's clear and the days are long, we really can't help ourselves. In the case of Ichabod, though, I really want to know. Mainly, I suppose, because I find it all a little embarrassing. You realize your Ichabod is a heron, right? I asked Clancy Chambers one morning as he was stenciling Heron tracks onto the park road ahead of the fall festival, which had been renamed Bodfest sometime during my absence. Well, yeah, he said, holding up the cardboard stencil. And a heron is not a crane, I said. He shrugged and started shaking his can of spray paint. Who said anything about cranes? I'm pretty sure Ichabod wasn't a thing when I was here 20 years ago. If he existed at all, it certainly wasn't like it is now. The Burley Flow is still known as the Riverman, and until recently had a man in a canoe, I'm not kidding, as his logo. You never know it with all the herons that have popped up. In shop windows, as cutouts on lawns holding babies in their beaks, at the top of the community building's weather vane. Though 20 years is a long time, it doesn't really seem long enough to forget about something as major as the adoption of a town mascot. People are usually pretty attached to their origin stories. And then there's a the practical nature of it all. Wouldn't it take some coordinated effort to get community buy-in for something like that? 20 years ago, they were trying to figure out what to do with Lottie's, the old supper club at the edge of town, and they're still working on that rezoning. I suppose it does sound a little cult-like, admitted Jeannie Donovan, a part-time teller at the bank. Do you think this is how Scientology got started? Jeannie Donovan has never found a problem she couldn't blame on Scientology. Everything from the price of stamps to the shift in terminology from global warming to climate change to the actual changing or not of the climate itself, she lays it all at the feet of L. Ron Hubbard and his, quote, fruitcake disciples. My Jesus didn't write science fiction, she says. He was science fiction. The coherence of that statement aside, she wasn't necessarily wrong when it came to Ichabod. It did feel as if the community had been brainwashed into believing the same outlandish story, that once, fishing on the banks of the river by Founder's Rock, a heron known as Ichabod gave a fish to the starving man who would become the town's founding father. Of course it's too good to be true. Betty Wainwright told me. Anything like that is. I mean, do you really think Tobias Wade looked out across the river and said what he said? The fact that the town's librarian and de facto historian could be so casually dismissive of what was universally understood to be the gospel truth of the town's founding, the trapper and eventual statesman Tobias Trevelyan Wade would reach the Mississippi, stand atop the massive rock he found on its banks, and declare as a burly flow, startled me. If you couldn't believe that, what could you believe? Exactly, she said. 
history is just a story. But stories have to have authors, and as far as I could tell, this one about Ichabod just spontaneously developed while I was gone, and no one seemed to remember when or how. Yeah, it all just kind of started up, Joey Garnavillo said over coffee at the gas station. All that talk about Ichabod. For the longest time, I thought somebody had named the heron and hung out down at the ramp. Me and Eldon Arnold used to love to watch him strut around. It was like he owned the place. When he's not house-sitting or mowing lawns, Joey Garnavello takes people fishing. Most mornings, during the warm months, you can find him down at the ramp waiting for his clients, many of whom stay at Laddie's Landing Resort. Like everyone else in town, Eldon Arnold uses the ramp to make phone calls, since it's always been the only place in town with reliable signal. And as owner of Eldon's Market, the town's grocery store, he has plenty of calls to make. Though Laddie has his own ramp, he charges a $5 launch fee for non-guests that he refuses to waive for Joey, even when his clients are guests who, more often than not, are staying with Laddie specifically to fish with Joey. Consequently, Joey makes everyone meet him at the public ramp, where there's a bathroom, better parking, and an extra five bucks buys him a yearly launch pass. I could see Laddie being a big proponent of the company's store concept, Joey says. I hear he charges poor Lucas by the flush to use the toilet in the office over there. At the time, Lucas Christie was the new editor of the Burley Flow Dispatch, the town's newspaper and part of Laddie's business empire, whose offices share space with the resort. I'd actually worked with Lucas for several years at the paper in Georgia, before I moved over to the university for my last couple years in Altoona. I'd only been up here a couple of months when I heard Alt Altoona, the paper down there had shut down, and as a courtesy, I let Lucas know about the opening at the dispatch. I didn't think he'd be interested in something as small and, well, small as the dispatch, but given the current employment climate for reporters, I figured it wouldn't hurt to let him know about it. I suppose it's weird that two people from the same city in Georgia, let alone former co-workers, should end up in Burley Flow at more or less the same time, Statistically, you could probably even call it an invasion. But honestly, it feels more awkward than anything. People assume we must have been great friends, and while we were always friendly, at the end of the day, we really just shared a boss and some of the same frustrations for a while. And though we used to be able to talk shop for hours, it's actually surprising how little interest we have in talking about our shared past here. Like Facebook friends from high school, nothing from back then seems particularly relevant anymore, leaving us feeling ill at ease more often than not. Still, ill at ease or not, he was someone who might know something about Ichabod, or at least where else to look. I found him on Laddie's gas dock, pumping sewage out of one of Laddie's houseboats. Other duties as assigned, I asked. <laughs> something like that, he said holding tight to the hose. Judging from his tan, Laddie was keeping him pretty busy with these other duties. Journalists are, by and large, a pasty lot. Anyway, it's not like there's archives, he said after I'd filled him in. The only back issues are the ones he keeps for wrapping up the stuff he sells on eBay. I chuckled. That's a strange way to inflate readership numbers. You don't know the half of it, he said. I saw Lucas again that weekend at Bodfest. He was taking photos of the long line in front of the merchandise tent, where Eldon Arnold stood at the table scanning credit cards while two of his usual stockers scrambled to distribute the goods. People couldn't seem to get enough of the Ichabod stuff. Everything from t-shirts and koozies to water bottles and beer mugs. I myself was wearing an Ichabod ball cap I bought from Eldon's Market earlier in the week. He'd loaded up the seasonal shelves with Ichabod merchandise about a month earlier, and from the way people around town were dressed, sales had been steady and strong. I can't say for sure that I was about to put two and two together and potentially solve my little mystery, but when Lucas caught my eye over his viewfinder, glanced at Eldon and gave me an are-you-thinking-what-I'm-thinking look, it dawned on me that, yeah, I actually was. We may never know for sure how Ichabod the Heron came to be, 
but I, for one, am willing to believe it was Eldon Arnold. Because as any journalist will tell you, whatever the question is, the answer is always follow the money. Well, that's it for this week. Thanks for stopping by, and when you get a chance, don't forget to check out the website at burlyflow.com. There's some cool stuff there I think you'll like. Thanks again. We'll catch you later. <laughs>